Welcome, everyone, and thank you all for attending. Happy Social Work Month. My name is Joan Davis Whalen. I'm a field education coordinator with Memorial University School of Social Work and a social worker here in St. John's, Newfoundland. On behalf of CASW, we're so happy to be offering this important webinar on settler engagement with truth and reconciliation. Before introducing our speakers, I want to note all of the formalities, such as the details like how to access the recording of this presentation, how to download the slide deck, how to get your certificate of attendance, and all other information is written down in the welcome widget that popped up when you logged on. If you don't see it, click on the loudspeaker icon at the bottom of your window or type your question into the question box on the screen. As for the format, we will have time for questions at the end, so please ask those throughout. Our speakers have so generously provided some additional reading, and you can download that in the resources widget where you can also access the slide deck at the left of your screen. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this webinar. Carolyn Campbell. As a retired social work professor, Carolyn is shifting her focus to citizen-based education and is particularly passionate about joining with other non-Indigenous people as they explore their roles and responsibilities for truth and reconciliation with Indigenous people. As part of this work, she has facilitated the Blanket Exercise, an experiential exercise that illustrates Canada's colonial history, co-organized a Questioning Canada 150 event, and designed and facilitated an eight-hour course stepping up non-Indigenous people's roles in truth and reconciliation. Our second presenter is Sherry McConnell. Sherry is a white settler and a genderqueer butch lesbian feminist. She was born and raised in Regina, Saskatchewan on Treaty 4 land and lived the next 20 years in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan on Treaty 6 land, then moving to St. John's, Newfoundland, where she currently resides on the traditional lands of the Beothic. Sherry has worked and volunteered primarily with women, Indigenous people, and queer folk around their experiences with the criminal justice system, substance abuse, child sexual abuse, and other forms of personal and systemic oppression. She currently works as a social work educator with a primary focus on field education at the Memorial University School of Social Work. So with all of that being said, I'm really looking forward to this workshop, and it's my pleasure to pass the microphone to our speakers. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sherry McConnell, and Carolyn is um, right alongside me in Halifax. Um, I'm going to do the first bit, the introductions and purpose, then Carolyn will talk about fundamental beliefs, then I'm going to read a spoken word piece that I wrote over the last year, and then we'll come back to Carolyn for some considerations on social work. Then we'll have time for some questions and comments. So as we start, this seemed like an apt picture, especially with two of us being settlers in Atlantic Canada. It's apt both for the topic at hand and for the presentation. With only an hour of your time today, um, we will only skim the surface and will not be able to dive as deeply as, as Carolyn would in a full day workshop. Um, and I think the same is true of the topic, that sometimes we see only the surface and it takes some work on our part to look beneath the surface to understand some of the history and context and experiences both of settlers and of indigenous peoples. And really, I think for Carolyn and I, our hope today is that we can expose some of what lies out of sight and out of mind. And in doing so, all of us can be open to the multiple understandings and perceptions and perspectives that each of us have as individuals, whether we're indigenous or non-indigenous. And all of that needs to happen before we can consider social work's connection to truth and reconciliation. So we chose to use the term settler in our presentation today, recognizing that it's not a perfect term and that not everyone agrees with its use. 
it's important that we do recognize that there are many politics involved in the term settler, as there are in all the terms we use to label ourselves and each other, and many complexities. We recognize that depending on where we came from, when we came here, and whether we came of our own free will or by force, we will have differing understandings of the term settler. We also believe that settler goes beyond geographic origins. In fact, many folks who are now exploring what's known as the settler identity, and in that they refer to settler as a worldview that includes its own unique ways of knowing, being, and, diff and doing which differ considerably from those within indigenous worldviews. Okay, thanks, Sherry, for that introduction. You commented that uh, this is Carolyn speaking now, and thank you to everyone who's here. Um, Sherry commented that I was in Halifax, actually. I'm, I'm just outside of Wolfville in uh, actually the Mi'kmaq territory, which is known as the wild potato section of Mi'kmaq. So I always get a some fun out of that. So as Sherry said, we know that we'll just be scratching the surface, so to speak, um, today. But we wanted to start after that introduction <clears throat> with just discussing some of what are our fundamental beliefs about how we think we need to start thinking about truth and reconciliation as settler peoples. And the first is the recognition, which I think comes fairly easy to most of us, that the relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples um, continue to be and have been pretty fractured, pretty full of misunderstanding and suspicion, distrust, oppression, um, violence, uh, appropriation, many kinds of not-so-good things have influenced our relationships. So that's one of the beliefs we bring to this. The next belief is that we as settler people have not done collectively a very good job at recognizing and accepting our role for those fractured relationships and following from that, that we haven't really done our share um, about learning how to do it differently and about how to mend those relationships. So that's kind of a second fundamental that we, we bring to this work. But we're also encouraged um, that many non-Indigenous people have shown that they're willing to step up um, and finally engage. And I would say that for, I didn't check the numbers recently, but for all of you that are at this webinar, um, that's one of the very exciting indications that uh, non-Indigenous people are willing to move to a place of taking some responsibility. So that's another sort of exciting premise and, and optimistic premise of this particular presentation. Next, um, we want to recognize that the creation of new relationships is really, really difficult. And I know Sherry and I have talked about this as we've talked about trying to do this work um, and the, the, the title of unsettling ourselves. Um, it is extremely unsettling work to do. Um, to figure out what this history is about and how we can do it differently. So we're really suggesting that people enter this process with humility um, and without that awareness and intention, we're at risk of repeating a lot of the mistakes that we made before. Um, this is rather a long slide, but one of the it's our belief that one of the more important things that we need to do intentionally when we try and develop awareness about what does it mean to be a settler or a non-Indigenous person is that we have to turn our gaze inward. So when, I, when I've done these kinds of presentations, when there's people in front of me and you throw out the question, what is one thing that non-Indigenous people can do for truth and reconciliation? Many, many people say, well, let's learn about Indigenous history or let's go to an Indigenous event like a powwow or something. Those are all very important things to do. But we also believe that 
prior to that, we need to look at our own worldviews, our culture, and our practices as settlers. Um, that has brought us to the place where we are. So that's one of the reasons why certainly this webinar is open to anyone, but our focus is on the growth and development of people who define themselves as settlers and who wish to participate in decolonization. Um, we want to be very, very clear that we know we cannot and do not speak for Indigenous people. We're very committed to doing our own work, and we invite any of you listening, um, if we cross the line where it seems to be that we are speaking for Indigenous people, that you clearly remind us of that and hold us accountable, because that is not what we can do. Um, we've heard a lot of conversation uh, since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report has come out how relationship is grounded in relationship. And those can be relationships at multiple, multiple levels. Um, relationships among people, relationships between people and their communities, relationship between people and their governments, relationships among nations. <clears throat> I think something that has taken me a long time to even begin to understand, though, is that really fundamental to reconciliation is understanding different ways of relationship with the land and that reconciliation is about relationship to land. <clears throat> In some of the reading that we've been doing, some people have sort of phrased it as to what, what preposition does one use to describe the relationship you have with land? Are you on this land? Do you have a relationship to this land? Or do you have a relationship with this land? And those three propositions can have considerably different meanings. And I think it's important um, that if we are really going to understand issues of reconciliation, that we begin to struggle with those different perceptions of land. So, Again, these we are taking, this is a quote from an Indigenous person, so whenever we bring this in, we're sure that we're quoting from Indigenous people and not speaking for them. So land from an Indigenous thought is the sustainer of life, central to identity, as a pharmacy, as sacred, and as home. The land's not a machine, but it's a community of respected, human and non-human persons that we have a responsibility to. Another, um, we don't have it on the slide, but another way of thinking about it that a, an Indigenous person uh, wrote that I read is we wouldn't think about, at least not yet in our world, about owning air. And it's the same kind of way that you don't think about owning land. You are in relationship with land. And that's substantively different from an Indigenous or sorry, from a settler perspective on land. Generally, settlers see land as capital, as property, commodity, or as a resource to be exploited. And the quote that uh, you have there on this particular slide is a quote that came from a letter to the editor in the St. John's paper. Um, the Sherry, you can jump in if I have this wrong, but it's my understanding that the St. John's City Council decided to do a land acknowledgement uh, at their meetings. And there was a letter to the editor that was speaking in opposition to that and made this comment about land. It's a long established law that if one lives openly on unoccupied land without confrontation for a minimum of 20 years, that land belongs to the claimant. So that whole perspective of unused or un so-called unoccupied land being able to be belong to someone else is a fundamental um, premise or understanding that allowed our ancestors to basically colonize this land because from their point of view, they didn't see it as being used in the way that it should have been used. Central to that as well, that this conception of land, which gave the legitimacy to 
our settlers' claims, so-called claims to the indigenous land, began with the doctrine of discovery. And we bring this in here, and this is where we definitely will just be scratching the surface, but we believe that this is, no matter what one does around indigenous and non-indigenous relationships, that this particular doctrine is something that we all need to be aware of. Interesting, I was at a, um, <clears throat> a lecture that Buffy St. Marie did uh, earlier this year, and it was a very, very large lecture hall. I'm sure there were at least a 1,000 people there. And she asked how many of us were familiar with this doctrine of discovery. And there were about, at the maximum, I think, five hands that went up in that room. So I would ask those of us listening if this is something you would have ever heard of. And for me, if you had asked me 10 years ago, it's not something I would have known. But it's basically a papal bull that was issued in 1493 that gave the explorers the Christian sanction um, to claim any land and to um, the barbarous nations could be overthrown and brought to the faith. So it's not so much a premise of what we are doing here today, but a piece of essential knowledge that many of us as settler people don't understand. And it's very interesting that both the Royal Commission on the Status of uh, Aboriginal People that was done in 1996 the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report that came out recently, and the United Nations Rights of Indigenous Peoples all call for the repudiation of this doctrine of discovery. And to this point, our Canadian government has not been prepared to do that. Um, so if anyone wants to do some social action, that might be an interesting piece. So those are some of the fundamental assumptions that we're bringing to this work and a few of the fundamental pieces that we think are really important for people to understand, and particularly that reconciliation has to be about land. So I'm going to send the mic back to Sherry, and as she said, she has a spoken word piece that she's been uh, working on for quite some time, so I'm going to look forward to hearing her do it in this context. So back to you, Sherry. Thanks, Carolyn. Um... This piece of work is unlike how I typically write. I'm sort of the typical academic in how I write, but I was really moved to think differently about who I am as a settler and how I am in the world after attending the uh, National Indigenous Social Work Conference a year and a half ago. And I started thinking about a poem from the 1970s called For the Straight Folks Who Don't Mind Gays But Wish They Weren't So Blatant, written by Pat Parker. And when I came out in the 80s, I was introduced to that piece of work. And it, it stuck in my mind when I was thinking about decolonization and reconciliation. And, and so I'm actually previewing this piece um, today. And would love any feedback that, that people have to offer. So for settlers who say that they support decolonization but wish, wish it weren't hard. You know, some people have got a lot of nerve. Sometimes I don't believe the things I see and hear. Have you met the settler who wants things to be better for our natives but isn't sure what to do so does nothing? or ask indigenous people to tell them what to do to fix it. Yet we say that we support decolonization. Or the settler who knows little or nothing of the impact or the history of colonization or of its current manifestations. Yet we say that we support decolonization. Or, to the, set, or the settler who thinks that they know everything about indigenous people their culture, their history, their issues, and is convinced that they have nothing more to learn about colonization or reconciliation, yet we say that we support decolonization. Or the settler who thinks that colonization happened a long, long time ago and is over now, and that indigenous people are dwelling on the past, 
and should get over it and move past it. Yet we say that we support decolonization. Or the settler who thinks that all of the work of truth-telling and reconciliation lies with indigenous peoples. Yet we say that we support decolonization. Or the settler who gets hurt, upset, offended when indigenous people do not instantly forgive them or welcome them or want to be friends with them or even want to engage with them. Yet we say that we support decolonization. Or the non-white settler who because of their or their ancestors' experiences with oppression and colonization feels justified in disclaiming their role in the colonization of Turtle Island, despite the fact that no matter where we came from, how we got here, or the color of our skin, all of us who have come to Turtle Island in the past 500 or so years have done so as un uninvited guests. Yet we say that we support decolonization. Or the settler who, ignoring the fact that we are all treaty people, lives on treaty land or unceded land and has no idea about the history or the promises and agreements in any of the numerous pre- and post-Confederation treaties between our colonial governments and Aboriginal peoples. Yet we say that we support decolonization. Or the settler who attends a presentation, class, workshop on reconciliation, decolonization, and diverts the discussion by apologizing profusely because they feel guilty, ashamed, complicit, then wants to be reassured, comforted by the presenter and any other indigenous people in the room. Yet we say that we support decolonization. Or another settler at the same or a different presentation, class, workshop, who takes over the agenda by talking about their experiences of oppression, colonization, or that of their ancestors, and thinks that it's all the same. Yet we say that we support decolonization. Or the settler who, after living a life of white privilege, finds an indigenous person way back in their family tree and applies for Indian status so they don't have to pay taxes, and so that they and their children can go to university for free, despite the fact that Indian status and indigenous identity, which are separate yet interconnected, are so much more profound and complex and political than getting a free ride. And yet we say that we support decolonization or the settler who complains about immigrants and refugees stealing their jobs and taking away their way of life and the future of their children, and ignores the fact that, as settlers, each of us lives on stolen land and has contributed to the destruction of indigenous culture and spirituality and the lives of generations of indigenous peoples and has played a role in the devastation of the land, the water, the air, and all living beings. Yet we say that we support decolonization. Or the settler who just wants things to get better without doing the work or giving up any of their privilege or unearned power, yet we say that we support decolonization. The fact is that we as settlers need to take responsibility for doing our own work around reconciliation and decolonization in consultation with indigenous peoples so that we don't mess up decolonizing and reconciling like we have so many other things. We need to make a commitment to learn about our history, the history of the people whose lands we occupy and our role, and the role of our ancestors in colonization. We need to change 
our attitudes and our behavior. And we need to address our own privilege, which means relinquishing unearned power. We need to name and rise up against oppressive and hurtful words and statements and behaviors and policies and practices. And we need to work collaboratively to change the systems and structures and institutions that continue to perpetuate colonization and oppress indigenous peoples. We need to stand up and speak out for the rights of indigenous peoples, including, but not limited to, the promises and obligations outlined in the treaties, rights to self-determination and self-government, rights to land and clean water and resources, rights to well-funded, accessible, culturally relevant education and health care, rights for Indigenous people to raise their children in their communities, rights for them to determine who is Indigenous and who belongs to their family, community, nation. We need to be humble by acknowledging and embracing our mistakes which, in essence, means becoming teachable. We need to be honest, be respectful, and take responsibility for ourselves, our history, and our role in the present moment. We need to get over settler guilt and complacency and get on with what needs doing to restore what must be restored repair what must be repaired, and return what must be returned. And we need to actively protect, care for, and honor the land, the water, the skies, and all living beings. As settlers actively participating in the process of reconciling and decolonizing means working with and walking beside not in front or behind. It necessitates understanding that we are all related, which involves recognizing and honoring our similarities and our differences and building relationships grounded in honesty, integrity, trust, and respect. It means not hijacking the agenda or the process and not shirking our commitment to social justice and equity, nor our responsibility to take action and make change in the world. It means finding opportunities to sit in circles with Indigenous peoples, when invited and when welcomed. And sometimes it means recognizing that not being welcomed or invited is a sign that we have not done our own work or behaved respectfully or taken the time to build trusting and authentic relationships. It also means supporting Indigenous-only spaces and events in whatever way that is asked of us, spiritually, intrinsically, concretely. Succinctly, Actively participating in this process means opening our hearts and our eyes and our ears and listening, truly listening, which often means keeping our mouths closed more than is comfortable or familiar. It entails bringing our humility, our courage, our respect, our integrity, our authenticity, our generosity, our kindness, and our sense of humor. All of these things will help us build stronger and more harmonious relationships and thus safer and healthy, healthier communities so that we can live together in dignity, peace, and prosperity on these lands we now share. All of this and more will support each of us in fully participating in the ongoing work of reconciliation and decolonization. <laughs>
Over to you, Carolyn. Thanks, Sherry. When Sherry and I were working on this, we sort of said, well, you know, most a lot of what we said isn't really addressing social work all that much. And we talked about that for quite a while because we know, or we're assuming, that most of you who are here are social workers and are interested what you can do as professional social workers to advance reconciliation. Um, but we decided to stay with the format that you've just experienced because we firmly believe, like any critically reflective analysis process in social work, that it is really important to get to some of the stuff that's below the surface. If we just start talking about behavior and change without really recognizing some of those fundamental assumptions and belief systems that have brought us to where we are, I think we'll just repeat the same mistakes over again. So we're just offering a few more quotes here from um, some Indigenous and non-Indigenous writers about social work. And as the first one says there, this is from Gail Bakey, um, social work, we've not been terribly reflective about the fact that our theories, our policies, our practices are pretty rooted in Euro-Western assumptions. And because we haven't looked at that, then we haven't deconstructed our profession. Um, and related to that is the further comment that Gail makes, that all our values, our ethics, regulations, are still very, very connected to colonizing practices. We're trying to apply one set of universal codes to everyone, and that doesn't work. We've realized in many, many ways that that's not right. Um, one of the comments that the Canadian Association of Social Work Education made recently is that we absolutely have to acknowledge um, that the colonizing narratives that have guided our history are firmly embedded in social work education, in social work research, and in social work practice. So that's why we spent some time on these fundamental assumptions before we wanted to sort of move to what that means for social work. Our hope is that we'll have some time to have some discussion about that with you and how that's played out for you. Oops, I thought we had a second quote on... Ah, missed a slide. Sorry about that. Um, this is a non-Indigenous writer who's saying basically the same thing, that social workers are continuing to play um, a key role in the colonization process. Um, <clears throat> Both are true. How do, how do we reconcile that? How do we say, yes, we want to change this, knowing that we're still rooted in these ways of knowing, being, and doing? I uh, did that one. So I think that's basically what Sherry and I wanted to present at this time, but we do have, I think, a good period of time left for questions. So Joan, I'll send it back to you to see if anything that has come in from people or where we could go with that. So we're really hoping people will jump in and make this meaningful to you. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Carolyn, and thank you, Sherry. It's a really interesting and rich discussion that we need to have in this country, and particularly as, as social workers. Um, so I want to say first up, thank you so much for the presentation, um, and we can start getting to some audience questions. Um, if you haven't yet, you can question by typing it in on the box on your screen. We'll try to get to as many as we can. We may not get to everybody, but we hope you'll understand. So let's just start off first, and I'll pretend I'm Oprah, uh, with uh, some questions, I guess, that popped into my head as, as you were talking, right? What do you two think really stops us as social workers and as people from facing these truths that you've been talking about? Sherry, you want to go first on this one? Yeah. I think a piece of it is we're worried about doing it wrong. Hmm. I know that for a long time I was afraid that if I spoke about what I know about Indigenous people that I would be risking um, cultural appropriation. And so I didn't say things that I needed to say and I didn't incorporate Indigenous thought into my teaching. Um, and it was very helpful for me to read something by Cindy Baskin that said, we can teach about, 
indigenous culture and experiences, but we can't teach those experiences. And I think that was really helpful for me in sorting out the, the line that I was so afraid of crossing. I think another piece is thinking of the iceberg in the second slide. Reconciliation and, and decolonization are really overwhelming. And sometimes we just don't know what to do or how to do it. And I think that's a piece of why um, I wrote the, the spoken word piece I did was to help me figure out and maybe to share some of that with other people around what are some of the, the concrete things that we can do to make a difference. What are your thoughts, yeah. Carolyn? Yeah, I was certainly going to mention the iceberg idea, that, that it feels so big and there's so much that keeps us going in our busy lives that it's just like, oh, I can't go there. Um, Another piece that I'd add that certainly has been part of my journey, though, personally, is that this reality is really hard to face. Um, so, you know, in some of the work that, that reading that I've been doing, you kind of come to the conclusion that I have absolutely no right to be where I live. Um, and for a person who really feels connected to land and to the spirituality of land, to suddenly have to kind of uh, internalize this idea that, well, I'm only here because of violence and appropriation and so on, um, to work my way through that to say, well, all right, if I'm going to be a guest on this land, how can I be a good guest? And that's emotionally a really, really challenging process. It puts you sometimes in a, a scary, vulnerable place. But what I've learned is that we have to stay in that place, again, which is the, the title of what we're doing. It's an unsettling place to be. Um, but there's a lot of potential in that, that unsettling place, too. And I think the other thing, too, as I would add, is there's just so much that we don't know um, that we stay away from it. A lot of good points. A lot of the, the questions that are coming in uh, from our listeners across the country are asking in terms about the whole concept of land and reconciliation and people wanting to talk a little bit more about that and what does that mean. And I think sometimes, too, people are wondering, what does that mean? Does it mean giving back land? Like, how do, how do you have a, a vision of this, or do you have a vision, or in terms of that whole process, right? Um, Sherry, if you want to go ahead, I'm just looking for something that I think would, would be helpful to people, but I can't find it right now. So you go ahead first, and then I'll <laughs> jump in. Sorry. That's oh, wait right. a sec. I found it. No, I found it. <laughs> it's, um, because that is one of the scary parts. What do you mean reconciliation is about land? So I live here out in a rural area outside of Wolfville. Does that mean I'm going to have to go back to Scotland? What does that mean? And there's an indigenous writer called um, Arthur Manuel who has a manifesto for decolonization or for reconciliation. And he gives, in his last chapter, he gives six steps. But the fourth one is really interesting, and I found it very uh, reassuring. Um, so he talks about how some, we have to recognize some of these truths and that we have to acknowledge indigenous right to self-determination and so on. Those are his first three steps. But then he says this, and I am going to take the time to read it to you. He says, at this point, and that's after we've recognized, let's say, the rights of Indigenous people, we can finally sit down together for the long, grown-up talk about who we are and what we need and about who you are and what you need. Now, he's writing this as an Indigenous person. And then he says, and we can then begin to sort out the complicated questions about access to our lands and sharing the benefits. These talks can, indeed, lead to reconciliation but only after our rights as title holders and decision makers on the land and our economic and cultural needs are met. We will in turn will ensure that your very real human right to be here after 400 years is respected and your economic and cultural needs are also met. That's the end of his quote. So we don't really know what that's going to look like. 
we really don't know what, what it's going to look like. We have to kind of step into that unsettled place and imagine how things could be different. But certainly anything I've ever read or heard from Indigenous folks, they're not saying go back where you came from. They welcomed us with the concept of sharing and I think that is the concept that would continue to inform those discussions after we give a full recognition of rights and titles. I don't know if that helps or Sherry, if you want to add anything. No, I think that that covers a very complex yeah. question in I a think very I'll, short time. Yeah, I think too it's, it's interesting because um, a lot of the comments and questions that are coming in for people are talking about so many different aspects and what how this conversation is stimulating people to think about this whole topic in, in different ways, right? One of the things that people are asking about are, you know, it, this is such a big and such a complex topic, right? And sometimes people really do feel overwhelmed, and they're kind of wondering what can they do simply that would make a difference, right? Any suggestions or ideas? Okay, well, I'm going to jump in, Sherry, first, because I don't think we can start with the idea of what can I do first. Um, depending on where we're all at a different point in this journey, but to me, it's really important to start with what do I know first. So one of the things that I know, and Joan, you can clarify this, you have ac the participants will have access to somewhere is some basic reading about settler identity and what do, what do we need to know about our country. So for example, the book called Unsettling the Settler Within by Paulette Regan. Just, it brings up the things we have to know. We, we, we're social workers and we really want to jump right away to action and to do something. And that's really important, but there's some things we have to know before we start doing or we're just going to mess it up again. Gary? I think that's really true. Educating myself has been really important. And what's been important is me not relying on my Indigenous friends and colleagues to tell me how to do yes. this. Um, I certainly talk to them and we have great discussions, but I don't expect them to pave the path for me or to set direction for me. Um, it, for me, it's meant that I've done lots of reading. I've done lots of talking with people. When I'm with Indigenous colleagues and friends, I tend to listen. And as I sort of mentioned in my spoken word piece, I've had to move myself to the uncomfortable place of listening more than I speak. And to being open to learn from others and their experiences and to put my ego aside in this process and to try and figure out ways to not take up so much space. And and I think all of those pieces are really key. Yeah. I think, too, a lot of people online are, are referring to the fact that, you know, and then that, that's that piece in terms of reconciliation, because we know this is so important, in terms of trying not to offend people, right? Trying to engage, and at the same time, um, recognizing that, I mean, we know that indigenous helping knowledges have a lot to offer in terms of social work, but how do we use that knowledge without appropriating, right, and being respectful? Well, Sherry talked about a line that worked for her that she had learned, like, from Cindy Baskin's work and so on. Um, my line, I think, is a little different, Sherry. I don't know, we haven't really talked about this together, but... I'm not, I don't think we can be in a position of, as Sherry said, teaching Indigenous knowledges or trying to incorporate Indigenous practices. But we can share what we know about colonization because that's our history um, as well. And, and I guess I would push people a little bit to ask, what, what does, where does the fear of offending come from? Yes, we're worried about distressing someone else. But are we also worried perhaps about getting called out ourselves and that that's going to make us feel uncomfortable? And again, that's that unsettled kind of place that we just have to be, have to be comfortable staying in. I, I'm not sure if that really addressed the question, Joan, but. I think, I think so. I, I, you know, because 
I think it recognizes that we all recognize that this is not a, there's no simple solution here, right? And no. it is an uncomfortable space for us. You know, and I'm speaking as myself as being someone who's definitely uh, you know, in that colonizing group, right? I can't comment on anyone else, but for me to stop and to think about this whole process and some of the important things that you've brought up today in terms of how we engage within this country. What are the issues? Because it's not strictly relationship. It's, I mean, it is the systems that have been created to support colonization and how we change that in terms of moving towards reconciliation and that journey. And there, there is a lot of information out there in relation to social work and in relation to just decolonization in general and a lot out there on Indigenous perspectives. I mean, the Indigenous folks are just having such a, um, what's the word, resurgence. Um, and there's just, like, I've got a, like a 15-page bibliography of stuff. It's not hard to find things. So. Yeah. I um, think the most important piece is that we do something <laughs> and not get paralyzed by feeling mm -hmm. overwhelmed or f worrying about doing it wrong or whatever. Even if we have a conversation with another person that says, I'm not sure about this, but, but I know that what is right now isn't okay. And if we start the dialogue like that, if we start the dialogue with same-minded people first because that's safer, then that's okay. And we'll build the strength and resources so that when we encounter people that say things that are oppressive or offensive or racist, that we have a better formulated response. And that we support yeah. each other in moving forward in whatever way that looks like for each of us as an individual. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing. The idea of supporting each other as settlers, and as Sherry also said, not we've got to do our own work, not relying on our Indigenous colleagues to teach us. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, I think some of the things that come up from a frontline point of view are how do we have um, those conversations? And I think you've talked about that. You've You've kind of got to be a little brave and go forward and knowing that not everything is, is, is crystal clear and there's no set path. But the other piece is, though, is that there are, how do you have respectful conversations with people who are well-meaning but they don't understand? And I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. I think we do it respectfully and from our heart. And we don't get defensive, and we don't set them up to get defensive. They may get defensive on their own, but I think that sometimes if we have these conversations from a place of antagonism, it just further divides. And if there's well, anything I've learned from my Indigenous colleagues, it's about building relationships. And so finding common ground and finding ways to speak to each other in a way that nurtures our growth and theirs. I also think that as, as social workers, we have the skills of helping people reframe things. So, you know, if a, if a woman says to us that she... You know, she, it makes sense to her that her husband, that her partner batters her. Well, we know how to ask gentle, reflective kind of questions to help reframe those stories. Um, do the same thing when you're talking to people who are particularly people who, as Joan, you used the phrase well-meaning, who do want yeah. to try and understand. Um, use those same kind of skills that we have for reframing to, you know, well, where where do you think you learned that from? Or I wonder if you thought that, you know, those kinds of questions. We know how to do that work. Everyone who's listening to us knows how to do that social work stuff. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're right, because I think we all recognize as social workers, too, that this is more than just an individual issue. 
it's a yeah. you know it's a community issue it's a group it's a policy issue it's a systemic problem right across the country right well, and it's a way of thinking. It's the stories that we've told ourselves. Like Paulette Regan talks a lot about how is it that as a Canadian nation, we don't know these things. What are the stories that we've told ourselves? And one of the ones she speaks about is that we're a benevolent, peacemaking society. And we tell ourselves that story, and it hides the violence that's happened in the colonization. So... I mean, again, for those of us who've done any, which is not me to any great extent, but any work with narrative stuff, we know how to to prompt restorying. So that's what we need to do at a at a national level with this stuff is is restory it. Definitely, definitely. Um, a couple of people have asked uh, Carolyn in terms of the whole piece around, uh, I guess, tools and ways that can help people uh, challenge the way that they think. And people are asking about the, the blanket ceremony. Um, as a, well, as a... yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, just if I can, just, it, it's yeah. really important to call it a blanket exercise, not ceremony, because ceremony yeah. would imply that it's an indigenous sort of thing. Um, yeah. Very briefly, for those who aren't familiar with it, the blanket exercise is an exercise that was developed by Cairo which is a uh, interdenominational faith organization. It's K-A-I-R-O-S, I think, is the organization. They have, by the way, an extremely good resource, particularly for faith-based communities, but for anyone, that's called the Strength for Climbing. Um, and it's referring to the challenge from uh, Justice Sinclair, which says, we have shown you the mountain, now it is your responsibility to climb it. Um, so the blanket exercise is an exercise that you do with a fairly large group of people. They've done it with huge, massive groups of people. I've done it with up to about 40. We have a number of blankets well, uh, out on the floor, and people are standing on those blankets. And then you go through aspects of Canadian colonization history that gradually drops people off those blankets. So they, you know, they were infected with smallpox blankets, so people died, and, and the land gets smaller and smaller. Um, I've done it with a group of people here a number of times, and I know many people have very, very different experiences with the blanket exercise. We've had some really, really good experiences where people have found it very, very uh, powerful, and it's a real experiential um, experience to exercise. We've also had situations where it has not worked that well because the planning has not been properly done. And we've had both Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples uh, as part of the exercise together. And we actually have further traumatized. Um, so the group of us who are trained to do that here now are very particular. If someone says, oh, will you come and do the blanket exercise? We insist on having a really, really... Um, in-depth discussion as to what you're looking for, who's doing it, why you want to be doing it, and who's going to be involved. Um, so yes, it's something that I would highly, if you get a chance to participate in, I would highly recommend it uh, as a settler. Um, in terms of doing it, um, I, I still like the exercise, but the pre-planning part of it is really important. So I hope that's enough. Um, I think we're giving people our, our emails. I'm more than happy to discuss that further if people are particularly interested. But it is a pretty powerful exercise. Yeah, that's really, really helpful. And that additional information, uh, uh, will, I'm sure, will be very helpful to people, right? Um, and as plus the fact I know that your, uh, in terms of additional resources uh, and your email addresses uh, will be very helpful to people. We're, we're winding down to the end of our time, unfortunately. And we probably have uh, just a few moments uh, for an additional question, or if there's any additional comments that either one of you would like to make in terms of like kind of a summation for this uh, session today, I, I will you know quite happily turn it to you for that. Carolyn, um, I like responding to questions. I feel like we've taken a lot of the airtime already. But 
I, I guess I'll go back to something Cher said is, is just do something. Don't, although I said do something is maybe the first do is to learn more. But, but, uh, as, as the last slide that popped up, we've got to start with the single steps. Um, you know, we've talked about, for me anyway, how sometimes this journey has been unsettling. But having said that, um, it's been incredibly enriching. Um, and I feel like by engaging on this journey of what does it mean to be a settler or to be a guest on this land, I, I think I'll uh, become a better person through this process. And I think we can also become much better social workers and offer much more, not just to Indigenous peoples, because I'm not sure what we have to offer there, but we can offer so much more to ourselves and other settlers. Gary? I think it's really, like Carolyn said and like I've said, about doing something, about learning, about taking the time to have conversations with each other. Um, and, and by building community and building relationships and reframing and challenging in respectful ways. And it's about baby steps. There's no way to make the kind of change that needs to be made in one fell swoop. And I think sometimes as social workers we have dreams of of changing the world as as Wonder Woman or Superman or whatever the, the superhero of the day is. And I think all of us from our practice know that change happens in baby steps and so often we plant seeds as social workers. We plant seeds and sometimes we get to see their growth later on and and sometimes the seeds we plant we don't know if they took or if they didn't take. But I hope that in this journey we plant seeds that grow strong and healthy and that that we plant seeds in many ways through our talk, through how we treat the land, through how we treat each other, through our relationships, and through our connection to this place that we call home now. So my fantasy is that that we keep taking baby steps and, and that we support each other in taking those steps and that we work with Indigenous people along this journey. Because we've screwed up a lot of things over the last 500 years, and, and it's really important that this process be a joint process and one based on consultation and trust and respect. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we're, we're running out of time rapidly here. I want to thank uh, Sherry and Carolyn for your time, your thoughts, and uh, your um, education uh, about continuing education for all of us on this important topic as settlers. And uh, hopefully that this is a starting point for many of us in terms of that whole process of learning, educating ourselves about what reconciliation means and our own role within that whole process. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Joan. Thank for you, folks. Yes, and thank you to everyone for participating. Totally.